Let's continue. <clears throat> and we can start by having a look at the poll responses. So uh, of the 30, looks like 33 online right now, we've got 35 responses. I think at one point there were 40 some online. So this should be pretty good representation. And the of the options that were chosen here, the vast majority were choosing that we would expect to see the output 11, 7, 11, 15, 11, when we add together the values from our two lists one by one. Let's have a quick look and see whether that is indeed the case. So our expectation here, we have these two lists, and because we're using the combination of range and the length function, and then one of the list values here, or list variables here, odd numbers, the expectation would be that we're gonna go through each one of these items one by one, and at the corresponding location in each list, add the values together. So first time through, at index zero, we should have one plus 10 between the two lists, so that should give us 11. The next time through, we should be at index number one, so the second item in the list, in which case we should have three plus four, then five plus six, seven plus eight, and nine plus two. So Putting that sequence together, we should get 11, 7, 11, 15, and 11. So the, the majority was correct in this case. Because the code is right here and I'm being lazy, I'm just going to copy and paste it, which you could have done yourself if you were uh, not wanting to sort of think about this first. But when you run it, you indeed see 11, 7, 11, 15, and 11. So <clears throat> that's our kind of overview for how for loops are working. We looked at an example of iterating over the items in the list directly with the uh, example of printing out cities. We looked at a couple examples of using the range function and also then using the combination of range and len together. And uh, before we move on to our next topic about conditional statements, I'll maybe just ask, are there any questions at this point or anything that was was unclear about for loops. So as you might imagine, you will have an opportunity during the exercise this week to make yourself more familiar with using for loops. And uh, so fear not if you're not 100% confident in using for loops yet, you'll get some time to practice. But as there aren't any questions, what I think we can do at this point is move on to our conditional statements part of the lesson. So again, you can go to the file browser and open up the conditional statements notebook. I'm gonna just hide my file browser tab so that you can see the screen a little bit better. But the basic idea for this part of the lesson is about making decisions in the code. So with for loops, we were executing things a finite number of times here we're going to now be making a decision about what parts of the code to, to execute on the basis of a condition. That's where this name conditional statements comes from. So it's essentially uh, a fairly intuitive idea and something you're probably more than familiar with already. And that is that if a certain condition is met, then some part of the code will be executed. And if not, then something else will, will happen. So that's the basic idea, and we can take a look at a simple example here that's already filled in for us. We have a variable here called temperature that's equal to 17. Then we have an if statement that says if temperature is greater than 25, then print whatever that temperature value is, is hot. If this condition's not true, so if temperature's not greater than 25, this print statement will not be executed, and instead, the statement that's underneath the else clause will be executed. In this case, it would print out that that temperature value is not hot. And if you run the cell here, because that's all you have to do, nothing to type in, you see that 17 is not hot according to the description we have, which is rather subjective, of course. Um, <clears throat> but basically, this is an example right from the start of how a conditional statement is working. So the, the structure looks somewhat like a for loop. So in this case, we start with if instead of for. 
Um, and this then has some condition. So the thing that follows the if statement should be something that is going to be either true or false. So in our case, our true or false condition is if the value of temperature is greater than 25. So that's either going to be true or that's not going to be true. If it is true, then this part of the code beneath the if statement will be executed. So if our temperature value was, let's say, 27 instead of 17, we would look at this, say 27 is greater than 25, that's true, and our expectation would be to see that 27 is hot, is the output we get, and sure enough, that's what we see when we run this, because since that condition is now true, this part of the code gets executed, whereas before, this condition was false, and so we didn't see that part get executed, but instead the part that was under the else condition. So the basic structure again starts with if, has some kind of thing that can be true or false, uh, and the condition in this case that is able to be true or false. If it's true, we execute this part. If it's false, then the else condition will be executed if one is given. So when this condition is not met, the code proceeds on to the else statement and then prints out this code or does whatever the code is that's, that's here. Similar to the for loop, as you can see, things are indented by four spaces here or whatever number of spaces, uh, of course, we recommend four, but uh, as long as you're consistent, it should work with, with more or less than that, uh, as long as that less than is not zero. Um, and yeah, structurally, it looks a bit like, uh, like a for loop because we start with some kind of statement, we end with a colon, and then we have indented code underneath it. Okay, so that's our kind of quick overview of what a condition looks like. Um, so, you know, we have a sort of opportunity to update your value of temperature to a hot temperature. So if you want, if you haven't done it already, you can copy and paste what's here. You can change the temperature to whatever you want and run the code and see, hopefully in this case, something different. I had forgot that this was here, so I've already demonstrated how this works. Um, but any temperature that you put in that's greater than 25, you should get that that temperature is hot as the output. If you put in a temperature of 25 here, you'll see that 25 is not hot because this condition is not true. 25 is not greater than 25. 25 is equal to 25. So in this example, then, this would still be false if you put in a value of, of 25 degrees here. This is something to be aware of because we'll come to dealing with some other kinds of comparisons. It's possible in Python to check whether a value is greater than or less than another value, but it's also possible to check if it's greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to another value, or to check if it's exactly equal to another value. So we'll, we'll see some examples of that coming up, but I just wanted to point out already that uh, if you put in the temperature of 25 degrees, because our condition is that it has to be greater than 25, this would still be false in that situation. Of course, if you put in 25.01, that is greater than 25, and so you see 25.01 is hot. So, um, yeah, you may encounter some challenges with, uh, with these conditions that, uh, that will come up, for instance, in the exercises related to whether you compare something to be equal to exactly or greater than or equal to or whatever. It's possible for us in using these conditional statements to only have an if statement. It's not possible to only have an else, but it is possible to only have an if. So um, what we could do is if we take our example here, let's just copy what we had above, but not copy the if, just temperature, and then if temperature is greater than 25, let's just put it back to what its original value was, was 17. So we have our condition if temperature is greater than 25, 17 of course is not greater than 25, and when you run this cell, nothing happens. You don't get any output. So it's perfectly fine to have an if condition and not have the else. Sometimes you want something to happen if a condition's true, but if not, then just keep going in the code. Don't, don't do 
anything. You don't have to have a separate kind of like empty statement there to just uh, to continue on. So this is perfectly fine. This condition's not true, so nothing happens. That's basically how we end up reading that one. So, um, yeah. Let's think about another example. Okay, we've been checking on temperatures, but we can think about another example. I guess it's not super relevant today, but, but it's been relevant this week. Uh, and that is whether or not it's raining out. So if the weather conditions are currently that it's raining, perhaps you're going to make a decision in your preparations to leave the house that you're going to wear a raincoat. If it's not raining, then you don't need to wear a raincoat. So our weather conditions set equal to rain. We have here if weather equals equals rain. So this is our comparison operation to check whether a value is exactly equal to another. When you have a single equal sign in Python, it basically reads as that you're trying to assign a value to a variable, for example, like here, whether equals rain means we're assigning this, this text string rain to a variable called weather. In a comparison, when you have double equals, it means you're checking to see is it exactly equal to uh, the string rain in this case. So if weather equals equals rain, print, wear a raincoat. If this condition's not true, no raincoat needed. Of course, in this example, because weather is equal to rain, this condition's true, and we see the output wear a raincoat. Of course, if we were to make it be sunny instead of rain and run this, then we get the other output because sunny is not equal to rain, and so no raincoat needed is the output that you get. One thing to be aware of, if we change our weather condition back to rain with a capital R, you'll see that no raincoat is needed. This is because capital letter R and lowercase letter R are not seen as exactly equal in a character string in Python. They are identified as different characters. So our condition here, that our weather must be exactly equal to lowercase rain, is not met, which means no raincoat needed. There are ways to get around this when doing these kind of comparisons of text strings. Um, we're not really going to go into this any, in any detail, but there are methods like uh, if we took weather.lower, that will take this character string that's stored in weather and make it lowercase. So if you were to add dot lower in here, you would now see that you need to wear a raincoat, and it doesn't matter whether you sort of put in things with weird capitalization or whatever, everything that's there in that string will be converted from uppercase to lowercase. And in that case, your comparison will work regardless of whether somebody is, you know, angry and putting in rain with all caps or whether they're sort of not that disappointed and put it in, in lowercase. Um, these kind of string manipulation things, I don't think we really go into that in very much detail here. Uh, back on the course webpage, I'm kind of getting a little bit diverting from our, our plan here, but I'll just show you. Uh, on the course webpage, down in the resources and the useful books and sites, um, I don't recall whether we mentioned it before, but if this page wants to load, we are working on a textbook that's based on this course and another, uh, the, the auto GIS course that follows. And I think if you go to the web page for that course, you'll find a lot of materials that look similar to those for this course. I think there is a section somewhere in here in our materials for the book about, uh, yeah, it's if you search for string, you would find this common string manipulation techniques. If you're interested in, in wanting to learn a little bit more about how to modify text strings in Python, you can go there and find the common string, mani string manipulation techniques and, uh, and learn things like how to split character strings into uh, different items in the list. And uh, I think there's also some things about replacing text. There's things about making uppercase, lowercase, and capitalizing things and whatever. So there's a bit of information here. Uh, it's actually in 
the end of the lesson, uh, I think in the basic programming concepts, basic elements of Python, I think it's at the end of that one in the section about working with text. So we talked about doing things like F strings and in the, the book equivalent lesson, we have a little bit about how to manipulate strings as well. So if you're interested, you can go on the course page to find the link to this uh, textbook that's a work in progress. Um, the idea with the textbook is that it would be openly available online. So this web page that you go to should be accessible. Even once the book is, is published, this, uh, this page will remain accessible with all the material there. So if you want to know how to manipulate strings, you can get a little bit of information there. And of course, if you start looking for string manipulation in Google and Python, uh, you'll find a, a bunch of different things there. So just wanted to point out this example for comparing strings that capital capitalization matters unless you do something like put dot lower to make sure that the, the string gets converted to lowercase. Okay, so uh, I think there's just a reminder here about indenting things. We've already seen that. But how about another chance to check your understanding? So <clears throat> you could imagine that if, if it's a particularly rainy day that you might need not only a rain coat but also boots. So we can add a, another instruction here that if the condition that the weather equals rain is met, that not only would it print out wear a raincoat, but also wear rain boots. So why don't you take a moment and try to do that yourself. You don't have to go to the polling page or anything, but you can just take our example we were working with above and modify it so that if the conditions are that it's raining, not only will you be told to wear a raincoat, but also to wear rain boots. All right, let's see what would we need to do here. So we have our example from earlier that we had modified to allow our weather condition to be in capital or lowercase letters. And we, of course, know that if it's raining, we print out wear a raincoat. If we want to also then print out that we would wear rain boots, we simply just need to add a second print statement underneath our first one for the if condition that would say then wear rain boots. And uh, I guess to be consistent, if we delete the exclamation mark that's there, in this case, what we would see is that if our weather condition is rain, not only do we print out wear a rain coat, but also print out wear rain boots. So nothing too tricky there. The whole point is that again, like a for loop, if you want to have multiple things happen when a given condition is true, you can have more than one line underneath here. You just need to make sure that it's indented. <clears throat> if you don't indent it, for example, if you were to do something like this, you're going to have some uh, potential trouble here. Let's run it and see what happens first. So. In this case, we get an invalid syntax, syntax error that comes up. And the reason for this is that what happens here is we have our, our if statement like we had it before. We have our first print statement there. Fine, no problem. This print statement is also perfectly fine. It's going to be executed, however, regardless of whether this condition is true or false because it's not indented. So when, it, when this text in here is indented within the if condition, that only gets executed if the condition's true. Here, when it's not indented anymore, that condition, it's not affected by the condition at all, so this would be printed regardless of whether or not this condition's true. But in this example, nothing happens, and we get a syntax error because of this. So when you have an if and an else combination, the expectation is that the if statement will have something indented underneath it. And then the place where you indicate that you want to have this other option, that you want to have uh, some code to execute if the if condition is not met, uh, will be given by an, an else statement. But what happens here by not indenting this line is we essentially say, okay, if statement over, 
So as far as Python is concerned, all of a sudden it encounters an else statement where it doesn't have a matching if to go along with it. So by not indenting this line, the reason we're getting a syntax error here is because it's almost as if we just completely got rid of this text entirely. And again, you can't have an else statement without an if that corresponds to it. You can have an if statement without an else because essentially the, uh, the if statement could be say, okay, if this is true, do something. If not, don't do anything. But there's no option to have an else statement without an if because here it's expecting to say like, uh, you know, what to do if something is not true, but you don't tell it any condition to, to check on. So if we delete those three lines, we get exactly the same output that we had before when we run the cell, and that is that says invalid syntax. If we go back and instead we remove the else statement here, just to demonstrate, what you'll see is that we get the same output we had before. Wear a raincoat and wear rain boots. But again, I mentioned that this wear rain boots is not included in our condition. So if we change our weather condition here to be sunny, we won't see wear a raincoat, but we'll be told to wear rain boots regardless of what the weather conditions are. And if that's your thing, that's fine. Um, I don't find rain boots particularly comfortable, so I don't think I want to wear them when it's sunny, but to, to each their own. Um, my kids are kind of fans of wearing rain boots just because they're easy to slip on and off and they don't have to worry about if they're going to go out and get muddy or whatever. So um, that's fine. So anyway, the point is that the indentation matters. The indentation changes what the code's going to do and you have to be a little bit aware of things like if you don't indent part of your code in an if statement, you may get unexpected behavior. So let's, uh, let's put things back to being kind of nice and working as we had it before with these two lines indented here. So if it's rainy, we see both the outputs. If it's sunny, we see only that no raincoat is needed. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about these comparison operations, the whole, or operators rather. The whole thing that we're doing with these conditional statements is to check and see whether a condition is true. And in order to check and see whether a condition is true, we need to use some kind of comparison operator. So we've seen so far greater than, right? When we were checking to see is the temperature greater than 25, and we've seen equal to, which checks to see whether something's exactly equal to another value. But of course, it's possible to do less than, it's possible to do less than or equal to. So in that case, you just have the less than and then an equal sign after it. Greater than or equal to is the same thing, but just with the greater than and then an equal sign. And it's also possible to check and see whether a value is not equal to another one, and that's with an exclamation mark followed by an equal sign. So that's the different uh, default options for comparing different values. Each time when you use one of these comparison operations, the idea is that you would get either a true or a false um, evaluation of that, that uh, comparison. So let's, uh, let's take a look here at how that works. So we had, for instance, temperature is greater than 25. You can just type that in by itself. If you want to kind of test out and see whether your condition makes sense and works the way you expect it to, you can just type in the condition without the if statement at all. And when we run this, what we see is that, uh, that we get back false. And if we just check, for instance, what the value of temperature is, it was 17 degrees. So if I go back and just put things to where they, the way they were, we're basically doing the comparison is 17 greater than 25. And Python says no. So I think that makes sense. And uh, if we said, for instance, weather equals equals rain, and we run that, we get here false as well. Why is that? Well, because weather is currently set equal to sunny. But if we were to say weather equals rain, and then do our comparison after that, maybe this is a useful example to see the difference between a single and double equal sign. So the first one's going to assign the value rain to the variable weather. 
The second one is going to check and see whether the value of weather is exactly equal to the text string rain. And in this case, we get back that it's true. So that's the whole thing with these conditional statements is something's either true or it's not true and is false. And based on whether something's true or false, your Python code will decide how to proceed from there. Let's have another look at an additional example. In this case, we have our temperature set equal to minus three. <clears throat> and we can add in one additional comparison operation that we haven't seen yet. So we could say first, if the temperature is greater than zero, so if temperature is greater than zero, and we'll have our condition here that we then in that situation we'll print out let's do an f string that's uh, our temperature is above freezing so that's true right temperature is greater than zero it's above freezing now we might also like to be able to check to see whether it is exactly equal to the freezing point, zero degrees Celsius. And we're going to do that with an LIF condition. LIF in this case is essentially a combination of else and if. So if this condition is not true, not only can we say else, like we've been doing before, which is giving it sort of what will happen if this condition is not met, but we can also say LIF, which is basically to say, okay, well, if this isn't true, how about we give another condition? And we could say, for example, in that case, temperature is exactly equal to zero. So if this is false, that the temperature is not greater than zero, the next thing we'll check is to say, okay, well, is the temperature exactly equal to zero? In that case, what we want to do is print out another F string, in which case we say temperature is freezing. So if we meet this condition that the value of our variable temperature is exactly equal to zero, then we should see that zero is freezing uh, would be our, our output. And finally, we can have an else condition here. So if it's not greater than zero and it's not exactly equal to zero, then what we're going to say is that logically, if none of those conditions are true, that our temperature value is below freezing. So this is a little bit of like uh, you know, stringing together some logic about how these different conditions would or would not be true. So we first check to see is the temperature greater than zero. If that's true, we print this statement here and we're done. None of the rest of this stuff would get executed. So if our temperature is greater than zero, this code gets ignored. These if statements and else if and things like that execute the first condition in the list of them that is true. So if the temperature is greater than zero, we print out that and we're done. If that condition is not true, we do the next comparison, which is to say, is the temperature exactly zero? If so, this gets printed and we're done. If not, we then go to the else condition, which is kind of like the garbage can. It collects whatever's left over and, uh, and we'll then run that. If the temperature is not greater than zero and it's not exactly equal to zero, logically it must be below zero, which means it's below freezing. So when we run the code like this, we see minus three is below freezing, as we would expect. We can then check out and see whether things are working as we expect by, for instance, deleting the negative sign here. So if we reassign temperature to be equal to three and run this code cell again, we see three is above freezing, okay? So far, it seems like we can identify something below freezing and something that is above freezing. What if we set it equal to zero? Does this condition identify properly as being equal to freezing? And yes, it does. Zero is freezing. The reason this works the way it does is because, of course, when you check to see is zero greater than zero, 
No, it's not. That's false. So this gets ignored and we move to the next condition. Is zero equal to zero? Yes, it is. And so in that case, we get the output from that statement there. I think we should be safe to make our zero value a decimal value as well. And if we set it equal to 0.0, .0 it does evaluate still that zero as an integer and 0.0, .0 as a floating point number are seen as equal to one another. But you have to be careful. This is a dangerous comparison to make because these numbers, when they're represented in the computer's memory, are represented with a finite precision. And there can be some cases where you might put in a number as being equal to 0.0. .0. Uh, I think actually when we looked back in the first week, we did the sine of pi, which should be exactly equal to zero. And we got a value that was like one times 10 to the minus 16. A very, very small number, but not exactly zero. That's an example of the computer representing a number that is very close to zero, but it's not able to be represented as exactly equal to zero. So when you do these kind of comparisons, Generally speaking, unless you know that you're going to be dealing with whole numbers, I would not suggest you do comparisons to check to see that a number is exactly equal to another one. Because sometimes the precision with which the numbers are represented in the computer's memory, uh, it might have 16 decimal places that it can represent the number, but it may vary in the representation in the computer's memory such that, um, I don't know if we, maybe we can break this by putting in more decimal values here or whether this will be okay. Regardless, this seems to be okay, but there will be occasions, for instance, where like the number 0.0, .0 would be stored in the memory in the computer as 0, 0.00, you know, whatever, however many zeros this is, and then one instead of a zero. And here we see that one times 10 to the minus 18 is above freezing. So you have to be a little bit careful with checking to see if numbers are exactly equal to um, another number, unless you're dealing with integer values. Whole numbers, it's not a problem. Decimal values, it's a little bit dangerous to do that kind of comparison. Uh, totally unnecessary to, to bring this up, other than the fact that in terms of programming approaches, I probably would not do things this way personally, um, unless I knew I was dealing with whole numbers. All right, let's take a look at uh, an example that you can think through now. So let's uh, do a little check of our understanding. So let's imagine yesterday it was 14 degrees. Today the high temperature is 10 and tomorrow the high temperature is supposed to be 13. We have here a list of different conditions and your task is to go here to our poll, which I need to make visible to you. Um, so you'll go to our polling page and tell us which of the following letters would be printed to the screen. So if this condition's met, we're going to print A. If another condition's met, we're going to print different letters. And so you can check and see, based on these comparisons, which letters you would expect to see printed to the screen in, uh, in this example case here. And you can vote on that. And once people have voted, we can continue from there. All right, let's see where the votes have fallen here. So we have 33 who have voted. Very nice representation of our uh, active students here today. And the distribution is a little bit broader than in some of the other examples here. So uh, leading the way is only B, but we also have B and C as a sort of option selected by several, as well as only C a and C, B and D, and then some other combination. Well, let's think through how this works. <clears throat> First off, we can take a look at our comparisons. And our conditions here, yesterday is less than or equal to today. So is the value 14 less than or equal to 10? No, so this condition's false. We wouldn't expect to see A printed to the screen. Today is not equal to tomorrow. So here we say 10 is not equal to 13, that's true. And so we would expect to see 
be printed to the screen. Because of the way this works in conditional statements in, in Python, and I think most programming languages work the same way, once you encounter the first condition that's true, you're done. That's it. You stop looking at the next combination. So even if these other conditions may be true, they won't be executed because the first condition that you meet in an if statement or if plus elif, the first one that's true gets executed and that's it. You don't go through and, and work on the others. So it's true that some of these other conditions would be evaluated as true, but you wouldn't see the letters printed to the screen because you're only going to see the first condition that's true printed to the screen. So yesterday greater than tomorrow, so is 14 greater than 13? Yes, it is. But because this has already been printed B, we wouldn't actually execute this part of the code. And today equals today is also true, but we wouldn't execute that. And if you just copy and paste it into the cell below there and run it, uh, okay, I suppose we also need to copy and paste the part where we put the numbers. So let's put our numbers in here. And you see, of course, the only thing that we get printed to the screen in this example is B. Because we have elif statements, I could basically delete the elif condition for B being printed and run this again, and then we get C printed because the first thing that's true in this case, A is still false, C is true. And of course, if I delete the C condition and run this, I would get D printed to the screen here because the D condition is also true that today is exactly equal to today. To today. But the key thing to think about here when using these if and elif conditions is that once you encounter one that's true, you stop looking at the other conditions. Logically, it's often the case that you're making one comparison based on the same kind of information. And so when you set your code up, if you want to see whether these other conditions could be true, you could make them all separate if statements instead of making them be elif. So in that case, you know, maybe you would say like, well, I, you know, rather than saying if I find one of these conditions is true and, and just stop, I just take this and say, well, let's make them all separate if statements. And if I do that, then I can see I get B, C, and D all printed to the screen because each one of these conditions is checked independently. But in the original way that it was set up, because we're using elif, then this says, okay, is this true? No, then is this true? And it's the first one of those that's true that would get executed and then you stop checking for the other elif conditions. All right, let's uh, cover a couple more things here and then we'll take a look at our exercise for this, this week. So in addition, to these comparison operations, which give you a true or false by themselves. We can also combine those conditions using the keywords and and the keyword or. So the way that this works is you can have a condition here. Um, I think, I don't know whether it's strictly required to put this in parentheses, but uh, your comparison would be typically wrapped in parentheses. Then you have the and statement and then another condition. So in our example here, we say if one is greater than zero and minus one is greater than zero, then we would print out that both parts are true. The way this works is basically it checks this condition and then the and says that, okay, both of these conditions need to be true in order for this if statement to be seen as true. If that's the case, then we would print out both parts are true. Otherwise, we know that at least one part is not true. We don't know which one of the two conditions necessarily is not true, but we know that at least one is not true. They both could be false, but um, the way that this works is basically uh, this will only be true if this condition is true and the second condition is also true. So when we run this, we see at least one part is not true. We know one is greater than zero, so that's true, but minus one is greater than zero is false. So then we see that at least one part is not true. If we made this instead of minus one, two, two is greater than zero would be true. If we rerun the code, then we see that both parts are true. So again, this is kind of uh, a bit of kind of basic logic for how the computer is operating, that we have a condition and the and operation will be true only when both parts of the two conditions are true. Uh, now, just to check this, do I need the parentheses? 
no. So the parentheses are sort of optional, although most of the time, I don't know, it's, uh, it doesn't hurt to put them there. It kind of helps visually to sort of make it easier to tell which, which conditions are which. So I typically will wrap my comparisons in parentheses when doing this kind of thing. So that's how and works. If both of these things are true, then the if statement would be true. Otherwise, it's not. For the or operation, that will be true if either one of the conditions is true or both. So if one is greater, or sorry, one is less than zero, that's false. Uh, minus one is less than zero, that's true. And in this case, we get output print at least uh, one test is true. We get this output because this condition is true. So for or, it's either one of them could be true or or both. For and, they both must be true. Uh, and that description is kind of given up here. So if you have A and B, that's going to be true if both A and B are true. If you have A or B, it's going to be true if either A or B is true or, or both. So that's how you can have multiple conditions. Um, we can take a look at an example here about that in just a second. And later on in the course, we'll be also using this kind of ampersand and the vertical bar. I don't know what they call that character pipe uh, thing for comparing lists of values. But, uh, but for now, we're just going to use and and or. This is just kind of a note that we'll also use some bitwise operators later on in the course. So let's again check our understanding here. So you can imagine a scenario here where we've already checked to see whether it's raining, but we can also check and see what the wind speed is. Uh, so I don't know where this sort of information comes from, but this eight meters per second is the limit for a fresh breeze, or sort of Navakatuli in Finnish, um, that we might be able to use as our condition to see, are we comfortable or not? And we could say, well, if it's windy or raining, let's just stay home. Otherwise, we can go out and enjoy the weather. So your task here is to set up an if condition that would check to see if it's windy or raining. And if that's the case, print out stay at home. Otherwise, you can print out go out and enjoy the weather because it's not windy or raining. So yeah, take a moment and do that and we'll continue from, from that point. Okay, so I think we should probably continue at this point. So our task was essentially to deal with the condition that if it's raining or if it's windy, then we'll just stay home. Otherwise, we can go out and enjoy the weather. So of course, we can start with an if statement here. And uh, we know in terms of like a structure that we're going to use this or condition because we, we just want to stay home if either one of these things is true. So for instance, if our weather is rain, we can put that in as our first condition. Our second condition would be that our wind speed is greater than uh, 8 meters Per second in this example. So if either one of those conditions is true. If it's rainy or if it's windy, then what we want to do is print out the text, just stay home, or something like that. Logically, if it's not raining, and if it's not windy, so neither one of these conditions are true, then it should be nice outside. So in that case, what we want to do is print that we can go out and enjoy the weather. So that's essentially the way that we set things up here. So we have our if statement, we have our condition number one, which is to check whether it's raining or 
And then our condition number two, which is to check that the wind speed is greater than eight. And if we run this with both the combination of rain and wind speed nine, we see that we should just stay home. That's because actually both of these conditions are true in this case. However, if the wind speed dropped and it's still rainy, we would also just stay home based on the logic that's here. So we don't, uh, in this case, you know, we don't need to meet both conditions, just if either one of them is true, then we're going to stay home. And of course, then if it was sunny and the wind speed was less than eight meters per second, we get to go out and enjoy the weather. So that's an example of how you can combine these multiple conditions. And you could think about this, you know, from the standpoint of your own personal perspective. You know, if it's rainy but not windy, or if it's windy but not rainy, maybe for you it's like, well, I'll go out and enjoy the weather. So you would then modify your statement here a little bit to say that the only time I want to stay home is if it's both rainy and windy. So you could replace the or with an and in that scenario. And, uh, well, here you would see that you're going to go out and enjoy the weather. It's sunny and four meter per second wind, but it could be rainy or raining and four meter per second wind. You would still go out and enjoy the weather in that scenario. Only in the case where it's rainy and the wind speed is above eight would you then just stay home. So uh, this can be customized to your own personal preferences in the example that's here. But of course, what we were demonstrating was the condition with an or statement, which is to say that if this or that are true, then you just stay home. Okay, one more example, and then we can take a look at our exercise for this week. So we can, as it turns out, combine what we've learned in the first part of the lesson about for loops today with conditional statements to do things like take a whole list of temperatures and check to see whether the temperature is hot if it's greater than 25 degrees, kind of going back to what we started with in our example here. So we could take for temperature in temperatures. So there's our for loop, and we'll take each one of the temperature values from our list called temperatures. With each one of those, we can check with an if statement to say if temperature is greater than 25, let's say that it's hot. So we could then have a print statement here with an F string where we'd say temperature in curly braces is hot. <clears throat> so that's what we would execute in the case that we meet the condition temperature is greater than 25. In our example here, because we've put this inside of a for loop, we're going to go through each one of the temperatures one by one and do this comparison each time so that we should expect to see output printed to the screen for each one of the five temperatures we have here. Well, actually, in this example so far, all we would see is output printed to the screen if the temperature was hot. If we add in our else condition, we can then print again with an F string that our temperature inside curly braces, temperature, is not hot. So in this case, we've now captured all of the cases that we're going to deal with. Here, we're gonna check and see is the temperature greater than 25. If it is, we're gonna print that the temperature is hot, otherwise, we're going to print that the temperature is not hot. And because this is inside a for loop, we're going to do that for each one of the temperatures in our list of temperatures here. So we'll check 0, then 28, then 12, then 17, and finally 30. So we have basically what we've been dealing with so far as an if statement, but it's now inside of a for loop. One thing to note before we run this is that, as you can see here, Everything that should be executed in the for loop is indented by four spaces itself. But then when you have an if statement in here, you have an additional indentation to indicate that this print statement is part of the if condition here. So you have kind of like levels of indentations that, uh, that you would use here. 
in this case. And if we didn't indent this if or else condition, you're going to get an indentation error that says, hold on, you have an if statement, but you didn't put any indented text underneath it. So this text beneath the if statement, just like it was before, needs to be indented by four spaces. But in the end, this ends up with eight spaces because we're inside a for loop where we already have some four spaces of indentation. So when you run the code through here, we go to each one of our temperatures. We see zero is not hot, 28 is hot, 12 is not hot, 17 is not hot, and 30 is hot. Does that make sense? Yeah, very good. That's what we have to cover today in terms of the Python lesson. We can take a look at the exercise, but I'll ask, do you have any questions at this point? So yes, this part, these parentheses are not strictly necessary. This will work like that without the parentheses. Yeah, that's correct. I find personally in terms of readability, I like to put my conditional statements if I have more than one in parentheses just because it's easier for me to see like what the, the condition is. Sometimes if you have a kind of long thing you're comparing, it can be sort of hard to, to just see like what's the actual piece I'm comparing or what, what's the thing that should be true or false. So I do personally typically put this in parentheses, but you're right, it's not necessary. It's not a requirement. Uh, it will work with parentheses there regardless. Um, but did I understand correctly that you were seeing that if you put in like capital R here, that this, so for me at least in this example, if the wind speed is nine and it's rain with a capital R, I see to just stay home. Now that's actually the result because here, this is actually going to evaluate as false and the thing is that the wind speed condition evaluates as true. In this example, like where the wind speed is nine and if we have capital R in, in rain, and if either one of these conditions is true in this example, we see to just stay home. At least for me, if I make uh, rain capital R and I lower the wind speed to five, for example, this capital R rain is not exactly equal to lowercase r rain, so this is false. Wind speed is also less than eight, so what I see in this case is to go out and enjoy the weather. So when you have the or condition, remember it's if either one of the conditions is true, the code would evaluate the whole if statement as being true. So I don't know if that explains it, but... So if we did weather.lower, then we see to just stay home because that will take the string that's rain with a capital R and make it lowercase. If we make this upper, which would make it uppercase, we see to go out and enjoy the weather because this effectively would now be a comparison of like rain in all caps being exactly equal to rain with lowercase letters. So, uh, I mean, if you were to do this as a kind of, you know, task that you were trying to use for you know, for, for your job or for your master's thesis or whatever, if you're going to compare strings, especially if you're not quite sure whether like something might have a capital letter or not, making it do dot lower and then comparing to the lowercase version of the string is the typical way to, to do it safely. Um, if you think about the situation like, you know, if you've ever used a, a, um, the command line to type things in, in the computer, Occasionally, you'll be asked, like, you know, to respond yes or no. And if you respond with capital Y E S, some programs will not see that it's the same as, like, if it asked you to say yes or no in lowercase. Uh, but typically, what would happen is that, like, if there's any, like, user input, you would take their input and make it dot lower so that you can compare things. So if they use capitals or not, uh, it's, it's the two strings get converted properly. But that's a little bit more of an advanced topic, so we don't really worry about dealing with string manipulation here just because we don't need to, to sort of bury you in, uh, in too many things from the start. But these string manipulation options in Python are very commonly used, especially for reading in data files where you have character strings as the, 
the values you're reading from the data. But any other questions at this point? So let's then go here, make this a little bit bigger. Exercise number three. So this week's exercise comprises four problems. Three of the problems will be graded. One of them is an optional task. It's a little bit more challenging. It's a fun one, but it's a little bit more challenging. So our four problems basically look like this, if I just open them up here. So our first example problem is uh, dealing with a typical process that you might want to tackle when you complete this course, and that is to do some batch processing of data files. So oftentimes you might have data files that have similar format for the data that's in them, and they may even have some kind of standard way in which the data files are named, and you want to write a Python code that would allow you to go through and do the same operations to each one of the data files. So in this problem, we are essentially, if I just scroll down to what you're going to end up doing, trying to create a Python list that looks like this. So it has some base name, in this case the text station, then there's an underscore, and then there's a number that comes after that, dot text. So if you had data files that followed this kind of format, one thing you might want to do is to create a list of all the data files you want to populate, or that you want to process, rather. Uh, so you populate your list with the, the different names here, like station 0.txt, station 1.txt, etc. And then you would go through with a for loop and go to each one of those data files and do something. Your task here is not to do anything with data files because we don't know how to deal with data files yet, but rather just to produce a list of file names that would look like this. So this is just hypothetical data you would be dealing with. So you'll create your list of, of file names, and that's kind of it for the first problem. So you'll use a for loop to make a list that looks like this. Problem number two is uh, needs to be refreshed because I don't know why it doesn't load properly. But uh, we're going to deal with classifying data. Again, this is something that's a pretty common task to, uh, to do when you're dealing with data files. So we're going to classify some temperatures here. And we're going to classify our temperatures into four different categories. So we have cold, which is going to correspond to temperatures that are less than two degrees. So again, Note that this is less than minus two, sorry. Less than minus two degrees, which we're considering cold. Not less than or equal to, but less than minus two degrees. Slippery, which is going to correspond to being warmer than minus two degrees, but less than plus two degrees. Then we have comfortable, which is going to correspond to temperatures that are warmer than plus two degrees, but less than plus 15 degrees and then warm, which would correspond to temperatures that are equal to or warmer than plus 15 degrees. Obviously, this is sort of like calibrated to finish conditions because probably there aren't people from other places that might think plus 15 is warm. But um, you're going to be given a list of different temperatures and then asked to use a for loop and and uh, some conditional statements to classify those temperatures into these four different categories. So you'll have this list of temperatures here, and your task will be to go through each one of those temperatures and to add them to four different lists that are here given uh, the names cold, slippery, comfortable, and warm. So when you check each one of the temperatures, it should be added to the corresponding list, as you can see here. Uh, I think after that, that's pretty much that's pretty much the task. So you'll have a couple different steps to do in there, but that's the end uh, goal is to do that. Problem three is about dealing with some location data, similar kind of task in a sense. Um, but we have, uh, in this case, identified the sort of approximate geographic center of Finland as being at uh, 
64 and a half degrees north, 26.3 degrees east, uh, so latitude and longitude in this case. And then we have weather stations that, uh, I think in this case, these are weather stations that have been operating for at least 70 years. And this is the distribution of those points. And your task is to take each one of the latitude and longitude of these weather stations and classify it as either being in the northwest, northeast, southwest, or southeast in our sort of geographic um, classification that we have here. So you can find a little bit more information about that, but you're given these station names, you're given the latitude and longitude of each one of the stations, and then you're given here our kind of cutoff values, uh, which as mentioned are 64 and a half degrees north and 26.3 degrees east for latitude and longitude respectively. Sort of like the last task, you're given then four lists, northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast, and asked to classify and, and sort of put each of the stations into the corresponding list for whether they're in the northeast, northwest, southwest, or southeast. And you should see uh, here whether or not you're you've correctly classified things in some of the code cells that are able to be run to test your results for this problem. You can then also, if you want to, uh, calculate what the percentage of the stations is that are in the different zones. So that's an additional kind of little bonus task. And finally, problem number four is about using nested for loops, so I don't think we saw an example of how to do this in class, but um, you can put a for loop inside a for loop. So in this case, we've got the, the string dog and the string cat, and we could say that uh, for each one of the characters in there, we could then print out um, character one and character two. This inner for loop will run through all three of its letters, for the first letter that's in dog. So we didn't actually see an example of this either, which is why we make this an optional task. You can iterate uh, over the characters in a string just like you can do with values inside a list. But um, anyway, you're given an example of how this works here just to sort of demonstrate uh, the basic idea. And your task is to make this sort of American flag looking uh, pattern here where you want to create a text string first where you would, uh, when you fill in your, your text string, if you printed out the value of text after your script or your code is run, you would get the star pattern like this. And then the next task is to modify what you've done so that when you print things out, you get this pattern that looks roughly like um, the sort of American flag type thing. So it's an optional task. It's, uh, it's, it's a kind of fun challenge if you're up for it and typically uh, at the start of class next week I'll show you how I've done this just in case you're interested and you know if you've had a hard time doing it um, I can show you an example of my solution and if Christoph is here and up for it he could maybe show you an example of how he would approach the problem. We can see whether we do it the same way. Most of the time, there's a bit of a different approach for each person, so that's kind of fun as well to see different ways to solve the same problem. But yeah, I think, are there any questions about the exercise? If not, I think that's probably it for today. So we'll have exercise sessions to give you some help both on Thursday and Friday. Exercise number two, again, the deadline has been extended till the end of the day on Friday. So um, if you're having challenges with your partner, you have an extra couple days to, to deal with that. And uh, otherwise, if you're having any other issues, please just let us know in Slack what's going on and we'll try to, uh, try to do what we can to make it so that you can work through the course materials without any trouble. But yeah, that's it for this week. Next week, we'll continue with, uh, with functions.